go back to the first race in 1973, I mean, it was a long, long time ago. And today people will look, look at those boats and say, oh, they weren't racing boats, they were, they were cruising boats, and you guys were in a bit of a doddle. Not so. Times were different then, ocean racing was different. You know, there was no radar, no GPS, no internet, no nothing. So you went to sea and you went to sea, and you found out who won the leg of the race when you got to the next port. It all began in 1973 as the Whitbread Round the World race when 17 boats left Portsmouth, England, to sail 27,000 miles around the globe, stopping at various ports before returning to Portsmouth for the finish. Time by item. got one minute, Scotty. Yeah. No problem, start going up. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Go, go, go. Seven races on, and what started as an adventure is now the Volvo Ocean Race. Professional crews at the pinnacle of their sport, racing flat out over nine months. Nine legs, 33,000 miles, and this is the route they took. The first half of the race comprises just three legs. Leg one taking the fleet from Southampton to Cape Town. Then across the Southern Ocean to Australia, where they joined the notorious Sydney to Hobart race before going on to New Zealand. Leaving Auckland, the boats head deep into the Southern Ocean, rounding Cape Horn to enter the relative safety of the South Atlantic on their way to Rio. America beckons with stops in Miami and Baltimore before the dash for home across the Atlantic to La Rochelle, Gothenburg and the finish in Kiel. But what exactly is it that makes these sailors leave their families and friends to risk everything to race across the world's most treacherous oceans? scared and tears are coming, you're so scared you can you almost freeze up, but at the same time you have a smile on your face. You'll be probably frightened at times, scared, worried, you'll hate it, you'll absolutely despise the fact that you're involved. And when you get to the finish you'll know why, because there's nothing like it. It gets in your blood and you can't get rid of it. And we pay tribute to yachting legend Sir Peter Blake. In 2001, he was tragically murdered when on an expedition to the Amazon. He sailed five Whitbread round the world races, winning on Steinlager II in 1989. As months of preparation finally came to an end, the eight crews said goodbye to loved ones, their hopes and dreams about to be tested as they left for the start line in Southampton. And they're off. Leg one of the 2001 Volvo Ocean Race was underway. Next stop, Cape Town. Armour Sports 2, led by Brit Lisa McDonald, was in trouble just seconds after the start with a ripped spinnaker. The all-female crew had only sailed together for one week, so the odds were certainly stacked against them. But off to a better start was Sweden's Asa Abloy with Dutchman Roy Heiner at the helm. American John Kostecki, skipper's race favourite, Germany's Ilbrook Challenge. While sailing under the Bermudan flag, Team Tycho is skippered by Kiwi Kevin Shoebridge. Media giant News Corp, with first-time skipper Britain's Jez Fanstone, will need all his skill to compete against race veteran Swede Gura Kramps on SEB. Another Scandinavian entry is Dejuice, skippered by Norwegian Knut Frostow. He looks forward to renewed battles with Grant Dalton on AMA Sports 1. Into the Atlantic, and Deduce was the first casualty of the strong winds and upwind battle. We had to take the mainsail down for uh, quite a few hours and try to make a uh, sort of uh, very creative car that could hold the thing up. Makeshift repairs lashing their sail to the mast allowed them to continue, but now dramatically off the pace. And a similar fate befell SEB, forcing an unplanned pit stop in the Canaries to collect replacement parts. 
but luckily their unscheduled stop forced them to take the less favoured easterly route, where stronger winds put them back in contention with the fleet. A sense of frustration in the doldrums was replaced by the need for a sense of humour. In age-old tradition, sailors crossing the equator for the first time were obliged to suffer the rituals and indignities of King Neptune and answer for their misdemeanours. Two thousand miles to go, and it was by now a real cat and mouse race, with the top five all in contention. Whilst the back markers were five days behind schedule and contemplating the need for food rationing, Asa Abloy were also in trouble. Navigator Mark Rudiger made a crucial decision to go east, which was to cost them dearly. There's no doubt about it, everybody's gutted. We'd spent, I think, two and a half weeks of hard sailing, very hard sailing, and we'd worked our way into what seemed to be a pretty comfortable second place. Um, we thought we'd done all the difficult uh, tactical parts of the race, and we felt, I, you feel robbed. It is sailing and these things happen, um, but there's like a deathly silence over the boats for, for the best part of 12 hours probably, and, um, and everybody's pretty upset. But skipper Roy Heiner remained positive, knowing nothing of the drama that was to unfold in Cape Town. The last week saw the exceptional ocean racing skills of Amersports 1's Grant Dalton lead into Cape Town. Only to be overtaken by the slick crew work of Ilbrook, right on the finish line. But the drama didn't finish there. Roy Heiner was sacked as skipper of Asa Abloy. It's not easy making a team out of people that are very good, that have a lot of egos, and uh, I mean, basically you do your best and uh, um, that's how the cookie crumbles, I guess. Uh, I need to go and sit on top of a mountain because I have to reflect on myself as well, I think. That's uh, to see where life goes from here onwards and uh, um, take it day by day, I guess. And so the end of a dream for Heiner and the beginning of an immense challenge for replacement skipper McDonald, husband of Amatou's skipper Lisa. To do any role, you need time to kind of um, mentally prepare yourself, get everything straight in your mind, just how you're going to approach it. And um, it's been a busy stopover anyway. Um, it's going to be very difficult to... Um, to get into the role quickly and you know it's going to take time so it's one of those things I haven't got so it's going to be a bit of a rush. With crew changes made, boats repaired and teams revitalised, the eight boats left Cape Town for leg two to Sydney to face the first Southern Ocean crossing. Eight, seven, six. The whole wind instruments are out, completely out. Give on. The fleet jostled for the lead in the narrow shipping lanes. Watch the rig. Watch the rig. Whilst at the same time having to avoid some of the spectator boats there to see them on their way. But it wasn't long before problems struck. Ilbrook were forced to call rival SCB for assistance when their boat started taking water on board and they realised that they were sinking. The problem was solved and all on board were safe. But this was to set the precedent for leg two, the disaster leg. Next to suffer was Tycho, a damaged rudder resulted in retirement from the lake. It's highly unlikely that we'll be doing any more racing in this league, that's for sure. Uh, it's more of a um, situation now of not risking the boat or uh, risking the people. So 
incredibly disappointing for us all here on board. And uh, reality sort of sunk in a little bit this morning. Just sort of scared and realised we we're 150 miles behind everyone else. But uh, we need to live to fight another day and we're going to um, get the boat to Sydney one way or the other. It wasn't just the boat suffering. Conditions began to take their toll on the crews as well. In the depths of the Southern Ocean, hundreds of miles from help, Keith Kilpatrick on AMA-1 had a serious intestinal blockage. I just said to Roger, I go, look, Roger, there's something wrong here. What do you think it could be? When's this going to stop? Because I'm really in a lot of discomfort here. It's always been my fear, uh, being a doctor on a few of these boats, that you get something like an intestinal obstruction because it can be a very life-threatening situation. Huh? Interesting situation here to be on a boat trying to... Uh, perform duties as a doctor and of course it's it's quite difficult we noticed uh, you have to put the uh, intravenous needle in when the boat is bumping around on uh, big waves it's not easy but thanks to the Australian Air Force dropping emergency medical supplies AMA-1 was bought the time they needed to reach Eclipse Island from where Keith would be airlifted to hospital and safety Meanwhile, another crucial tactical blunder from Asa Abloy. Off the southern coast of Australia, as they took the northern route round King Island, they dropped from third to sixth, leaving Ilbrook to win the race into Sydney, followed by SEB and News Corp. As the front runners made it to dry land, Dejuice and Ama One were fighting it out for fourth place and vital leg points. But within sight of the finish line, a massive brooch left AMA-1 floundering, the crew fighting to right the boat. Just like bodies everywhere, bodies in the water, spinning around the boat, spreaders in the water, masts in the water. It's just like, just utter, utter carnage. Having been thrown around the boat, it was a mortified Grant Dalton who was stretched off the boat with suspected broken ribs. Mate, this is, yeah, I'm fine. What I'd like to say is this is highly embarrassing. <laughs> it wasn't long before they were back on their way for leg three to Auckland, and for the first time in history as part of the Sydney Hobart race. And it was the VO60s who led the entire fleet into the Tasman Sea, where their design would be pushed to the limit, racing against the huge Maxis. Not only did the other boats put them to the test, so did the weather. With the extreme conditions came a sailor's worst nightmare. As a huge tornado charged towards the fleet, all they could do was sit tight and hope it passed them by. It just sort of charged towards us, and it was just uh, spreading, getting bigger and bigger, and you know, like, and we were, well, I was wondering what, what are we going to do? And ocean racing doesn't come without the unexpected. SEB found themselves in trouble again, losing their rudder, taking on gallons of water. We're heading north. Everybody else is heading south. So it's a very painful. No sun at all, and only one thing, thank God everybody's safe. So more bad luck and retirement from the leg for SEB. As quick as the wind came, it went, leaving the fleet stuck in a wind hole. It was Asa Abloy who picked up the breeze, making a break from the pack. We could make a, a detour around the, the Cape here, uh, uh, after Tasman Island and uh, uh, all the others went into less wind and we uh, arced around them and now we are in the lead which feels fantastic. We are four miles in front of the next boat so keep your fingers crossed. Whether it was keeping their fingers crossed or just great sailing, Asa Abloy were finally starting to perform. Taking the trophy in Hobart's first VO60 and first boat overall, an amazing achievement. A three-hour pit stop and the front runners are on their way to Auckland. But what's happened to the girls on AMA 2? It's terrible. <laughs> I'm gutted. 
<laughs> but it, we, as we were coming in, the boys were going out, and for every metre we go this way, they're gaining two that way. So it was devastating, yeah. yeah, yeah there's a... And once on shore, close inspection revealed more rudder damage. <laughs> it's not pretty. We probably won't make it to Auckland. And so a three-hour pit stop turned into one and a half days, leaving a gutted Lisa McDonald once again at the back of the fleet. Having more success was Asa Abloy, although not such a good day for crew Magnus Olsen. An injured back confined him to the galley, cooking obviously not his strong point. Look, the water, the gas is coming out everywhere and I have no control over it. Do you want me to pass you a match, Magnus? <laughs> no, then we're going to blow up. <laughs> Boys are waiting for a good dinner, and uh, I don't even have gas. It's a disaster. But this didn't stop them, and glory couldn't be taken away from Asa Abloy. Tipped as a fast boat, they proved Ilbrook could be beaten. Amma One came second into Auckland, with Tycho sneaking into third ahead of Ilbrook and News Corp. How many fingers? Two for victory, one victory there, Sydney Hobart, another victory there, uh, Sydney Auckland, yes. So after three legs, the overall standings look like this. Fantastic. <laughs> Oh, I can't talk, mate. Rudy! <laughs> You're a beauty, mate. I'm going to be living off this for the rest of my days. <laughs> Halfway around the world, 10 months since I've been home. And, uh, wow, what a feeling. What an amazing feeling. I never dreamed, not one second, that this could happen. As the eight teams competing in the 2001 Volvo Ocean Race prepared to leave Auckland, they were now halfway around the world. But with six legs to go, the race was still wide open. The tactics now began to change. The tropical conditions on leg five, Rio to Miami, brought erratic winds and thunderstorms before the first of the sprint legs from Miami to Baltimore. But before this lay another 2,000 miles of Southern Ocean, icebergs and Cape Horn. Let me think. Scenario. Evening watch. Last half hour. It's getting dark. Last light. Everything's getting really dusky. It's foggy. You've got about 400 yards visibility. And you're looking at your watch and it's 20 minutes to go. And you're thinking, oh, I'm just over this. It's blowing 35 knots. You're doing 25 knots of both speed. And you're hanging on the wheel. You haven't lost it. You haven't wiped out, everything's under control, it's just another day in the office. The navigator sticks his head up the hatch and he'll say, iceberg, on the bow. And you go, how far? One mile. One mile at 25 knots. You don't even want to think about it. It's like three minutes, you're on top of it. So, all of a sudden, you start. the heart starts going and the whole thing's now elevated to a level that you just didn't need. Because the end of your watch, you're over it. The sweat's coming down the back of your neck. Your feet are ice blocks, your hands are like ice blocks. Your face is raw red from the salt spray, and all of a sudden you're being told, iceberg, on the bow, one mile. Okay, so when you're driving in those conditions, you have a what we call a 10-degree envelope to steer in. You can go up 5 degrees or down 5 degrees, and either side of that is a wipeout. So you're quite limited about where you can steer, so you actually have very little time to react. You have to react instantaneously. Once you get the call, iceberg, you react. So we react, we come up five degrees and the navigator disappears, goes back to the radar, radar, click, goes back up. Second iceberg on the port bow and you're going, you're kidding. Is it the same iceberg? Uh, I don't know. Danny goes, the clock's ticking. Now you're within a minute of basically arriving in this scenario and you're actually not sure whether these two blips on the iceberg, on the radar, is one berg or two bergs. Is there a gap between them? How big is the gap? And all of this, all you have is at four or five hundred yards visibility in front of you. It looks like somebody just frappéed an iceberg right in your path, and it's all come out in assorted icebergs. 
and you have a guy stands up on your shoulder and he calls you up, down, and you basically drive through this pack ice, picking out the big bits to miss. All the time in your mind, you kind of remember somewhere, somebody in school kind of told you how much ice there was under the water, but you can't remember how much, and you don't want to. 80% of it's under the water. And you look at your watch, and it's five minutes before the end of your watch, and you're thinking, I'm over this. I just do not need this in my life. And all the time you're doing 25 knots, the hammer's down fully, you're just going. The boat is rocking down. And you just think, if we hit something bigger than six or eight feet across, we will actually compromise the hull and go down. You know, and you go down below, and you take your gloves off, and your feet are frozen, and your hands are frozen, and you curl up in your bunk, and you just pretend you're not there. And I don't need to do that anymore. That's my last time. I'm over it. And they were right to be nervous. SEB lost their mast, and the whole crew were in a life-threatening situation, forcing a second leg retirement. No score that came in just wildly knocked us over. The hit was about 47 knots, uh, and the boat uh, got a second hit and just spun out uh, with the angle and the waves. There was no way of controlling it, and you can just see the boat heeling over the wrong way, getting taken by a, a quarter wave on the stern, or they heard a loud bang down below, and the noise and the crush of carbon fiber and the mast falls down and the water just flooding down the companion way as the boat hits over. The feeling then I had was that, you know, what's going on on deck? Is everybody there? All of a sudden the less, least important thing in my life was the World Ocean Race. People hanging on to things under the water, gasping for air, and of course being responsible for whole package out there, uh, it was just a terrifying, horrible feeling. Head count, everybody there, and that inside sigh of relief is something I'll never forget. Never. Meanwhile, the remaining fleet had survived the icebergs and the infamous Cape Horn. Suddenly you have Cape Horn in front of you and you know if you can get around it, then you're safe. Woo the Cape Horn Seagull. All right. <laughs> Round Cape Horn and Amma One and Deduce opted to head east around the Falklands, whilst the rest of the fleet chose the more direct westerly route. Time would tell who was right. Once again, Ilbrook set the pace and hold on to their advantage, making it a fight for second. Just over a day from Rio, in fickle winds, the Deuce split from Tycho, Assa and Amersport 1. An inspired move which gave the Norwegian team their first podium finish, leaving a fight for third. Next up was leg five, Rio to Miami. The four and a half thousand mile leg took them up the coast of Brazil, through the doldrums and over the equator for the second time. With thousands of miles and varying conditions, the fleet stayed close with Tycho, Asa Avloy and Ilbrook, all up for top spot. 3,000 miles sail, 1,000 miles to go. Might as well have started yesterday. The fight went right down to the wire as the crews sailed relentlessly through the night. Assa and Ilbrook were separated by just 100 yards, and with exhausted crews, it was a battle of will to the finish. But Assa Abloy took first, establishing them as Ilbrook's main opposition. Miami to Baltimore was the first of the sprint legs. Inshore racing tactics were the key, and three days of racing meant constant and sleepless sailing. But the biggest challenge of the race was the Chesapeake Bay, where fickle tides, fluky winds and thousands of lobster pots to dodge were to add to the pressure. News Corps and AMA 1, who had poor results in the last leg, were vying for first place in light winds. While Asa Abloy made up ground to catch Ilbrook in a fight for third. 
but it was News Corps who proved to be the final winner, securing their first leg win. The overall standings in Baltimore were forcing the skippers to face the reality of what the final results could be. For deduce, two more seventh positions in legs five and six were beginning to weigh down the crew. And it was time for Knut to admit a few home truths about his boat. With our boat, that's not fast enough reaching. That's, that's clear because we know we have a pretty good sail program. We have um, same designers as News Corp. We have, we have good, good sails, you know, that's no doubt about that. And we have a um, good crew that works like hell and um, the boat is not fast enough. For News Corp, inconsistent performances up to Miami prompted Ross Field to step down as co-skipper, handing the reins to Jez Fanstone, who took them on to a much-needed win in Miami. I think the relief is only just setting in, and um, I think the elation will follow. Also underperforming with two retirements in earlier legs and a collision with Ilbrook after the start of leg five, SEB was in a precarious position. A race committee protest on arrival in Miami could have cost them their whole campaign, as under race rules, a team must retire if they sustain serious boat damage. But this time the Swedes were lucky. The decision was in their favour and their fourth place confirmed. Had we been disqualified or on a fifth place, which is in this case uh, the same thing, uh, this whole race would have been over totally for us. Now we have a fourth place, second place and a sixth, and we can still go for uh, maybe even a podium finish. And at this stage, Asa Abloy's tactics were now clear. Matching Ilbrook, move for move. Yes, Abloy have been sailing us all over the ocean today. Really been uh, quite frustrating. They've been taking us both out, slowing themselves down, slowing us down. And uh, really, I can't see their uh, tactics, but 4,000 miles to go, it's a bit early for that sort of carry-on. Asa Abloy's continued success with a second leg win in Miami and beating Ilbrook into Baltimore was really putting the pressure on John Kostecki and their lead was seeming less secure. Here you see everybody has totally copied our sail program. They, you know, everybody more or less has the same type of sail inventory that we have. So, um, yeah, they've caught up there. But um, we've always been a little bit slower downwind in light air. Uh, leg one, we showed that weakness and... Um, so far, we haven't really had a whole lot of that um, condition so far, and, 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 but we did on this leg, and so it, it hurt us. Not helped by a disastrous start out of Miami, Ilbrook crossed the line early, and in a rare moment, Kostecki vents his frustration. Run her off! Run her off! Jesus Christ! Need the boat handle, guys? Disaster for some meant brief glory for the girls, as Lisa McDonald led the fleet ahead of her husband on Asa Ablo. It's all worked out beautifully for us. There's my wife just in front of us holding some. But it was short-lived for the girls. They soon lost their lead and once again brought up the rear into Baltimore. Not the only one losing his cool on these two legs, you wouldn't want to be on AMA 1 when the position reports came in. Grant Dalton, certainly not known for hiding his feelings. Very ugly. Incredibly ugly. Lost nine miles. <laughs> Mate, that was a bad one. But his sheer determination paid dividends in leg six with a second place. We've got to get on our game and we'll do whatever's necessary to do that and I'm brutally ruthless to make sure this campaign stays on the podium. And what has happened to Tycho? 
A poor result in leg six leaves Kevin Shoebridge and crew in despair. Oh, the guys are, you know, they're bitterly disappointed, really. Like, we always expect a lot more of ourselves, and, and we needed to have a good leg this leg. Um, we needed to get out and, and cement our position, and, and it's now Dolts has got second, um, News Corp's won, which were the two boats closest to us. So we're, you know, right back to where we were two legs ago. So with only three legs left to go, here are the overall standings. In big seas, the racing was close with Ama One setting the early pace. But amazingly, by day two, it was Asa Abloy who led them through the English Channel, where head-to-head -head racing saw the front six separated by just three miles. But such close racing was not to the benefit of everyone. Unfortunately, we are not fastest horse on the track right now. And it was Asa Abloy who led into their home port for a tumultuous welcome. The first four boats arrived within five minutes of each other, making it the closest finish in the history of the race. It was hard to believe that after 32,000 miles of sailing, that the last 250 miles to Kiel would decide the top three places in the 2001 Volvo Ocean Race. Sure, it would be nice to have had it wrapped up before we came to uh, this last leg, but that's not the way it is, so it's um, a challenge. We feel we've got it all to go for and nothing to lose, so we're actually going to enjoy this leg. Our guys are all fired up and ready to go. There just seems to be a chasm of difference between finishing third overall and fifth, so you know it, it does come down to the next 24 or 30 hours. The start will be quite important to get away clean, and we do have a history of starting really well. We've got three boats tied for third place, and 24 hours we could be third overall. It's our leg, I hope. We'll go for it 100%. Nothing to lose, everything to win. In a carnival atmosphere, Gothenburg turned out in their hundreds of thousands to bid farewell to the eight crews who had given their all to win this, the world's premier ocean race. You've got a job better than that, guys. Bring it down, sir. And by the time they reached Anholt Island, the fleet split, with SEB, Tycho and News Corps going to the west, the others choosing an easterly course. With only four miles covering first to last, which side would pay remained to be seen. We're staying on the eastern side of, at the moment, aiming for the eastern side of the island with Asa, the husband, A1, the boss, <laughs> and the pink dragons. Uh, I think Ilbrook is somewhere up, in head, up ahead in the middle and anything can happen. And it did. All the yachts on the west of the course were losing out. SEB, News Corps and Tycho saw their early gains disappear. The wind died completely, forcing them to drop anchor to stop going backwards. Meanwhile, Deduce led the fleet six miles ahead of Ilbrook, with Asa Abloy in third, Amersports 1 and 2, 17 miles behind the leaders, were neck and neck in fourth. But it was Deduce who gambled everything with a nine-man crew and saved the best to last. With the finish line now in sight, thousands of spectators willed them towards their first leg victory. Good to win the leg. Good to win the leg. Very good. The best finish you can possibly theoretically and practically have. Oh, I, I had a 
had some dreams about winning it. I did. The first time in the race, we were the fastest dog. The girls on Amersports 2 also saved their best for last, not only coming fourth, but in doing so, beating their teammates on Amersports 1. Yes! I just so desperately wanted to show them that we could, and now that we have, it's just, I don't know, it's a really weird feeling. It's like, complete. <laughs> Finishing just in front of the girls was Asa Abloy, securing second place overall. I think we did a good job. It would always be nice to win. That was obviously our initial goal. We didn't quite make it, but we're happy with second. Second's good. It's a taste of what it takes. See you next time. Humbled by the girls, it was fifth place for Grant Dalton. What a champ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well done. I couldn't catch it. I like so. But it was still enough to put him on the podium. Third place overall. First, not first, but it's pretty good. I, I mean, we sort of reflected on it over the last few miles when we were coming in when we realised we were going to be in third place. And, and I think from where we've come from, you know, this time a year ago we didn't even have a boat. Um, and, you know, trials and tribulations, I think it's just fine. With the podium positions filled, this left SEB, Tycho and News Corp to ponder what might have been. It's going to take a while to get over this. We have so many people are fighting so hard with such a good project and somehow it just did not get our, you know, go our way with all the problems that maybe affected us somehow. We didn't know. You know? We, we, we will find out later on. But it's definitely way below our own expectations and, and uh, ambitions. Twenty-four hours or thirty-six hours, whatever it is. Uh, we anchored for four hours last night off the coast of Denmark, so we knew we were in trouble. But um, no, it's just been a long, hard old day. It's probably the most depressing thirty-six hours of our yacht racing careers, but. As I said, it's been nine months of, of, of fun and excitement and sheer joy to sail with these guys. And, um, you know, 36 hours out of that, maybe it's a price to pay. If you dare to dream, you've got to have a few nightmares to go along with them. But let's not forget second into Kiel, first overall and winner of the Volvo Ocean Race Trophy, Germany's own Elbrook Challenge. I have never seen anything like this. I will never see anything like this again. This is unbelievable. Look, I mean, this is incredible. Just incredible. This is incredible. This is unbelievable. A lot better than anybody expected. This is uh, sailing's premier sport right here. Unbelievable. I mean, I have an Olympic medal, but for sure, this is the best. Top. What an amazing race, what an amazing battle, what an amazing finish. You just can't say it better than that. This has just been a once in a lifetime experience and I wish I had my whole lifetime just to soak it all in. The final results then. First, Ilbrook Challenge. Second, Asa Abloy. And third, Amma Sports 1. That's it for now, but the Volvo Ocean Race will be back in 2005. Some of the crew was sick, including myself, and it definitely wasn't a way to start the leg. Going in my arms. Uh, run forward, both heads are both full water. It's just like, just utter, utter carnage. 50 knots in the Southern Ocean is um, about the max I'd ever like to see. It's really, surreally awesome. 
I'd never seen anything like it, and I fully intend to never see anything like it again for the rest of my life. It's the most depressing, unbelievable thing that can happen to you in a yacht race. Just got a message from the race headquarters. We broke the monohull world record for present mileage is 473 miles in 24 hours.